Good evening. evening. Y'all doing good tonight? Good. Some of those beautiful Arizona November days. Did you break the record? I heard they're saying the weather might break the record today. Okay. Well, at least it's not 100, you know. So we're in double digits, not triple digits. So that's okay. Well, it is good to have you with us tonight, and I, I would guess everyone has your lessons. You know the routine now, so anyone not have it? Everyone does? Good. Everyone's got an envelope? Good. Almost forgot to do the quiz this morning, and some couple of folks had to speak up, so you got to keep, you know, keep me on track. That's sometimes they forget. And, oh, we want to be sure you have your names on the envelope, full name, because there's going to be another Bible drawing, and the, uh, the names are going to be sure for two reasons. We need your names on there for that, and we need your full names on it for the graduation certificate. Remember? You are going to graduate. So, well, we need your, your names correctly on this. And if the ladies start asking questions like that, that's what it's all about. They're, they're trying to get the information so we have it all, all correct. Also, um, we're going to do the same thing this coming Sabbath. We did this week. Um, our service will be 10.45 in the morning. And I'll be announcing that through the week here. And uh, we'll have our same type of um, sequencing of the program. And a fellowship lunch again, which is always a lot of fun. So I, those of you who are able to stay, I hope you had a good time and enjoyed the food. It's nice to get together for that. Tonight there will be refreshments as usual. The ladies were talking to me this morning. They said some folks were asking about how they make some of the goodies out there. So I think they're thinking to put together a little cookbook, a little recipe book. <laughs> so that may be available here before we're all done. Because they are good, uh, good things that they're providing. Um, also, something else. Now I know you come in the evening, but if you were to happen to come Wednesday morning uh, for our next class, we have what's called an Adventist Book Center. Um, now that centers at what we call our conference office over in Scottsdale. But they have a mobile unit where they come out to the churches all over Arizona a couple times a year. And this Wednesday at 9.30 in the morning, even if you want to just run by to see what it looks like, and, and you know, not see what class, it's not a problem. But at 9.30, they're, they're here and they're going to have books and they're also going to have vegetarian food. Now, for those of you that made the potluck, you notice Everything was vegetarian. Now, all that evidence aren't vegetarian. That's not a doctrine. You've got to be a vegetarian uh, to be a part of our church here. But uh, the vegetarian diet is recommended. It's probably maybe a little healthier. And so um, they do have some vegetarian uh, foods. There are analogs, vegetarian hot dogs and stuff like that. So uh, it's, it's uh, an opportunity if you wanted to drop by at 30 or so, you're welcome to see that. And... Uh, I think that's it. So <laughs> something else may cross my mind when we're done, but that's that prayer as we start. Father, we thank you for this uh, lovely evening and that we can study your word again. And Father, we so realize our need of your spirit to be present. Your spirit gave us the word, and it's only through your spirit we can understand it. And so we claim the promise to be present tonight, open our understanding, our eyes to see and ears to hear your truth. I know you have a blessing for each of us. That's why you called us here today. And I pray that we'll receive that blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, modern prophets and visions. We're going to get right into it about how God communicates with us. It kind of makes sense if there is a God, which there is, and he wants to communicate with his people, which he does, but there's got to be a mechanism for that. And that's what we're looking at tonight. How does God communicate? Now this first um, question is actually comes from our first lesson, you might remember. Uh, we looked at this before. The book of Revelation is a prime example of how the prophetic gift operates. The first few verses explain the steps which are utilized in bringing a prophetic message from God to man. What are these steps? So let's go over here to Revelation chapter 1. And we'll review this and see how we got the book of Revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. 
And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed he that reads and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be to you and peace from him which is, which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before the throne. So, as we fill in our, our blanks here, the sequencing, it came from God to Jesus, and from Jesus to the servants, servants went from his angels to John, and John wrote it down in the book and gave it to the churches. Now, it would have been written in manuscripts, not in books, they didn't have books back then. And kind of the way it works that the, there are no original manuscripts available. You know, this goes back about 2,000 years ago. And, and so uh, the original manuscripts, say John wrote it, Paul wrote his letters, and the Gospels were written, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, so forth. So these manuscripts were written, they were the originals, and, and then they would make copies, scribes, who the scribe did, would make copies of the originals, and then make copies of the copies, and copies of the copies of the copies. <laughs> because the, man, the originals would get old, old manuscripts. And they would pass these around in the, around the churches. And, and so when you do a translation of the Bible, which the New Testament was in Greek, the Old Testament Hebrew, they want to get the oldest manuscript available. Because the closer you can get to the original, then the less apt for there to be uh, any kind of error or something. And sometimes scribes, they would write and get tired and then repeat. Essentially, when you look at some of the old manuscripts, um, there's a word, there's an expression for that. You'd see a verse written, and then they'd write it again, because it just happened and their eyes kept it. So, um, what you want to do then is get the oldest manuscript you can and then translate from that. Now, there was a time, and some people still do, that say, well, you don't know if the Bible you got today is valid from what was originally given. Well, here's where the Dead Sea Scrolls really helped. Remember the Dead Sea Scrolls? You might have heard about them discovered in the 1940s. Well, those scrolls go back to the time of Christ. And there were some manuscripts there, like in the book of Isaiah, kind of back up. So they were able to look at those scrolls that went back 2,000 years and compare to what we have today, no, no error, no problem. Same scriptures. So you know, it makes sense when you think about it. These folks that were translating and that were, you know, writing down the manuscripts and copying them, they believed these were from God, and they were. And so they're going to try to be very accurate on keeping it the same as it was originally. And so that's, that's how we got the Bible to us to today. And then, of course, God brought along the Gutenberg Press. And they were able to make many more copies rather than having to write them out. So today we've got many different translations that all come from these original manuscripts. Now I'm going to go to question two. To whom will God reveal his plans for the future? Very nice little verse over here in Amos 3, 7. Amos 3, 7. <coughs> he says here, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he reveals his secret unto his servants, the prophets. So filling in the blank, he reveals his messages, his secrets, his prophecies through prophets. He wants us to know what's going to happen. And like it says there, surely he'll do nothing except he reveals it through the prophets. And God does not want us to be caught unexpectedly, to be caught off guard. He wants us to know what's coming upon this earth. And he wants us to know how to remain faithful to him. What are the issues going to be? And, and that's what the study like we do is all about. We're learning what God's Word teaches so that we can be prepared for what's coming down the line. Like 
this week, Friday, we're going to study the mark of the beast. Now, that's a pretty serious study. Uh, and we know there is going to be a, a mark of the beast. And God wants us to know what that is. And he wants us to know how to avoid it. So that we can be on his side and not on the enemy's side. And that's why he's given us the prophetic message in his word so we can know. So <laughs> God's a very loving God. A very communicative God. He wants to commune with us and communicate through his word and of course through prayer. Now as we go to question three, where do true prophets get their information? Well, what we've been talking about here, 2 Peter 1.21. Knowing this, first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So where did they get their information? Holy men of God spoke as they were moved, inspired by the Holy Ghost. Uh, the word inspiration, we'll use that, you know, the Bible writers were inspired to write, comes from God breathed, that God breathed through them, spoke through them. Now, the way inspiration works, as you get to know the Bible and the writers, God gives the Bible writer, the prophet, the thoughts, maybe a dream, maybe a vision. He gives them what he wants them to communicate. But he leaves it up to them to communicate. So you're going to find in the Bible, um, different styles of writing. You think I might have mentioned this before. Um, like when I was in seminary, uh, I had to take what's called a Greek exegesis. Now that word exegesis means you need to translate it from the original Greek. So I had a choice. I could take the Gospel of John and that be for the course and translate John from the Greek. Or I could go to Romans. Paul's writings. Well, I'm kind of lazy, and Paul's writings are very sophisticated Greek, where John's writings are simple Greek. So, of course, I chose the simple. But you see, you, you can see their personality coming out, their education level coming out, because Paul was extremely well-educated. He probably would have become a great rabbi if he hadn't become a Christian. John, on the other hand, like a simple fisherman. He, he didn't have that kind of education. So again, God leaves it up to the prophet to use his own style of writing, his own vocabulary, level of education. Plus, you even see, like David in the Psalms, uh, poetic. You know, David had that side to him. And some of the Psalms are even put to music. And they're kind of fun to sing. Um, but that's David's personality. So that's how inspiration works. It's called thought inspiration. God gives them the thoughts, the vision, the dream, whatever, and leaves it up them to write. It's not like dictation, where you're just, you know, God's telling every word to write down. That's why in the Gospels, you're going to, like if you read the account of Christ's baptism, which we did the other day, you're going to read some things about the baptism in, in Matthew, and you're going to read about the same baptism in Luke and Mark. And you're going to get a little more. Each one remembers, as they recall it. And each one of them writes down what they recall. Now, what they're all writing is true. But as you read all three, for instance, you're going to pick up some details on one that may not be in the other. And so as you compare all three, you're going to get a fuller picture, maybe, of, of more events that took place there. And so, it's not that they're contradicting each other at all. It's just that they're putting down what the Spirit has impressed them to write about. He says, I want you to write about the baptism of Jesus. And then they recall, and the Spirit, of course, helps them. So that's, that's how it comes about. Only men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Must a prophet write a book of the Bible in order to be authoritative and true? And of course, the answer to that is no. Who did Jesus say was the greatest prophet? John the Baptist. He wrote nothing. <laughs> he, but he was called for a very important work. He was called to prepare the way for Christ. 
to call men and women to repentance, to turn from their sin, to prepare their hearts for when Christ the Messiah would appear, they'd be receptive to accept Christ. So his was a, an exceptionally important word. Christ called him the greatest of the prophets. Does God ever um, prophesy through women? And of course, the answer is yes. God's no respecter of persons. And you notice your note on this question five, and there was Anna, Miriam, Deborah was a judge in the Old Testament, hold up. And then Book of Acts talks about Philip's four daughters prophesying. So God can prophesy through a man, he can prophesy through a woman. As we go to number six, does God promise to speak through prophets in the last days? Good question. We're living in the last days. So let's go see. Joel. Joel. We want chapter two. <coughs> And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people should never be ashamed. You see that expression, I am? Remember when Moses spoke to God in the wilderness, and Moses said, well, who do I tell the people who sit? Remember what God said? I am. Remember when Jesus came to this world, and he was talking to the Jewish leaders, he said, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus was the I am of the Old Testament. <laughs> Jesus is God. He's the God that spoke to Moses and led Israel. Jesus is the I am. Notice what this text says in verse 27. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. Jesus came to the midst of Israel. The I am came to Israel. And that, they, that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people should never be ashamed. Now notice the next verse. And it shall come to pass afterward. After what? After the I am appeared. After the time of Jesus. After he would appear to Israel, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants, upon the handmaids, in those days will I pour out my spirit. You might remember on the day of Pentecost, they were asking, what's going on here? <laughs> and, and Peter quoted Joel, you might remember that in his sermon. He said, this is what's happening. What Joel said would happen. So when Jesus left to go back to the Father, he told his disciples, you read this in the Gospel of John, he said, I'm going to pray the Father that he will send you another comforter, the Holy Spirit. And so they prayed for 10 days. And at the end of that 10 days, it's called the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came. And the baptism or infilling of the Spirit became available to every Christian from that day forward. And, and that's exactly what God said he would do. And so he certainly points out that does God promise to speak through prophets in the last days? Uh, certainly so. The gift of prophet did not end uh, with the Old Testament. Now let's go on to uh, the spiritual gifts today then. We see it's going to be in the, in the end days. Je when Jesus ascended to heaven, he left gifts for the church. What are they? Ephesians 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Notice verse 7. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he said, when he ascended up on high when Christ went back to the Father, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. By the way, the captivity captive, you might remember when Jesus was resurrected, it says uh, many others that were in the graves were resurrected too. They went back to heaven with Jesus. That's what it means here. He led those who have been captives in the grave resurrected. He led them with him. We have time. I'm wondering. I'm going to, little things I'm going to add to you. Um, 
That was actually fulfilled. Remember we talked about the sanctuary in the Old Testament? And they had what they called the wave sheaf offering at the beginning of the harvest. They would bring some grain and they would bring it to the sanctuary on earth and offer it. And it was kind of a, an offering looking forward to the great harvest for that year. This was fulfillment of that wave sheaf. Jesus took, if you will, a handful of grain of the righteous that have been resurrected and taken them to the heavenly sanctuary up to heaven with him, which is was a great omen or celebration of the great harvest that would take place when he would come back and all of his people would be resurrected. It's amazing how many things are connected together here with the Old and New Testament. Now let's go on from here. We must also read verse um, 11. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. So, here's some of the gifts. They're called gifts of the Spirit. Apostles. Now, apostles, we know they're the apostles in the early church. Apostles essentially are individuals that are called by God uh, under God's inspiration. And they go um, many places in the world. To, to teach the gospel, uh, to, to, to bless the church. Um, and then there's prophets. Oops, sorry about that. Prophets, we've talked about them tonight. We'll get more on that as we go along. Evangelists. The individuals that have the gift of evangelists, we're all to share our faith. And God wants to use all of us to help lead others to Christ. But there are some individuals called especially for the work of evangelism. And these are individuals that dedicate their life to evangelism. Um, you, we're all familiar with Billy Graham. Uh, he would certainly have a gift of evangelism. That's what he felt called to. That's what he was called to. And he went all over the world as an evangelist, men and women accepting Christ. Then there's the gift of pastor and the gift of teacher. So these are some of the gifts of the Spirit. And then why were these gifts given? Let's read verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So you just fill out that the blanks there. For the perfecting of the saints. A better word than perfecting in the Greek would be equipping. To equip the saints, God's people. And what does God want to equip us to do? For the work of ministry. So you see, God, through pastors, teachers, evangelists, prophets, whatever. These gifts are given to prepare you and me, to equip you and me so we can do ministry in the church, out of the church, whatever we're called to do. That's their purpose. For the edifying of the body of the Christ. That's why I think you can see how that works. As God equips us and he blesses us with the Holy Spirit and with the gifts of the Spirit he chooses to manifest through us, then we become a blessing to the body of Christ, which is the church. And that's why when we, we study baptism, that's why it's important to be a part of a church. Because we need one another. <laughs> that we're to edify, spirit working through each other to edify. So it edifies the church from within. We grow spiritually. And also from without, others will get to know Jesus and become a part of the body of Christ, the edification. How long were these gifts to remain in the church? Let's notice verse 13. Till we all come to the unity of faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, and to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So you're just filling in the blanks on that. So basically, what happened until the Lord comes? Till we all come to the unity of faith. The knowledge, where we need to grow in knowledge of Christ. Perfect man, growing into the the character of Jesus, it's a growth process. Don't get discouraged if you don't see yourself where you want to be. It takes time. <laughs> and But you, well, we got to learn how to cooperate with God in the growth process of becoming more and more like Jesus. And so, into the perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And when Jesus comes, those who are ready to meet Jesus will be like Jesus. That's what it's all about. Now, as we look at God's church today, when you find 
and um, and enter the church with the, the gifts, what will it do for you? Um, verse 14. Now we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whether by the light wing to the sea. So how can these benefit us? So so we're not like children. <laughs> Tossed around by everyone in the You know, you, you all know this. There's a lot of teachings out there. You can turn on radio, you can turn on television. A lot of winds of doctrine <laughs> flying around here, flying around there. How can you know? Well, with the gifts of the Spirit of function in the church, and, and you're learning and you're growing in the knowledge of God's Word, you're getting stead, stable in the Bible, then you become a mature Christian in the Word, in the Lord. And when that happens, you're not tossed to and fro. You become a stable Christian. And, and that's, that's so important as we near the end time. Because Satan, is, he's working hard now, and he's going to even work harder to gather all he can to create confusion and lead people astray. Did, God, did God's New Testament church have a gift of prophecy? Well, let's go over here to um, uh, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 6. He says, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. So, yes, the testimony of Christ was confirmed. And to let you see how this connects, notice Revelation 19.10. Keep in your mind the testimony of Christ, or the testimony of Jesus. Keep that in your mind here, because that's what we're looking at. Now I'm going to Revelation 19.10. And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said to me, See that you do, do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So when he said that the testimony of Christ, the testimony of Jesus, yes, the spirit of prophecy, the gift of prophecy was functioning in the early church. Now, I just want to use this text as an example. Remember every wind of doctrine, and when you get stabilized in the word of God, you won't get deceived, you won't get tossed around. You all heard of apparitions that appear, and they appear as some character in the Bible, sometimes Mary, whatever, and people bow down to it. Notice here, verse 10, here was an angel of God, and John said, I fell at his feet to worship him. I guess that could be a natural reaction, you see a holy angel, you know. But notice what this holy angel said. See, you do it not. Don't worship me. I'm your fellow servant, <laughs> and I'm your brother that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. See? Hey, so right here is a doctrine, if you will. If you knew this doctrine, that God and God alone is the only one to be bowed down to and worship, you would be protected. If some apparition or something showed up, or if somebody told you, hey, there's this thing going on over here, we need to go see it. You see how it protects you from being blown this way or that way? It's so important because if it's an angel from God, they won't let you bow down. But if there's some apparition appearing and it's letting you bow down to it, guess who it is? It's not a holy angel, it would be an, an evil spirit. But they can look good. And they can sound good. So it, it's, again, so important to know what God's Word teaches on these things. Number 12, does Revelation teach that God's true church for the last days will have the gift of prophecy? Well, let's go to Revelation 12, 17. Revelation chapter 12 describes God's church from the time of Christ to the end time. It talks about the persecution the church goes through, which we looked at some. And the last verse talks about God's last church. That's where Jesus comes. 
And it says here in verse 17, And the dragon, that's Satan, was wroth, meaning angry, with the woman, the church, and he went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Now what's remnant? The last part. That's what a remnant is. The remnants. The last part. So Satan is especially angry with the church and the remnant of her seed, God's last people on earth, where Jesus comes. Then he describes them. They keep the commandments of God, and secondly, they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, we just looked at Revelation 19.10. What's the testimony of Jesus? The Spirit of prophecy. So, will God's last church have that? Of course. It makes sense they would. If there's ever a time we need God's direction through the prophetic gift, it will be in the last days. Because God foresees what's coming and we need, need God's prophetic gift to guide us. Now, true prophets of God, we know there's true and there's false. What three things does Paul command regarding prophets? 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5. 20 and 21. He says, despise not prophesying. In other words, be open to it. Now, you want to be cautious because there's false prophets too. But there are true. So don't despise prophesying. Be open to the possibility of the gift of a prophet being manifest. But he says, prove all things. So prove to be sure it's of God. And hold fast that which is good. If it is of God, hang on to it. You don't want to get rid of it. So those are very practical counsels. Paul was a very practical man. Despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. And as we go to the next one, this, this helps to show us how we can do that. How do I test or prove that the prophets of God are not? Let's go to Isaiah 8. Verse 19 and 20. Isaiah 8, 19 and 20. And when they shall say to you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and to wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God for the living and the dead? To the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it's because there is no light in them. So that's pretty straight. They must speak according to the word of God. It says if they speak not according to the word, because there's no light. So that's why this is our only safety. You can't go by your feelings or the senses, you know, it looks good, it sounds good. No, you gotta go by the word of God. That's the test. And as you, we got a list here. What other things will true prophets uh, will um, will be the true prophet of God? Uh, this is in your question 15, and then you just list them here. A true prophet of God prophesies as he's moved by the Holy Spirit, not by man's will. He doesn't give his own interpretation. He's giving what God has given him. He points out sins of people against <coughs> God, like John the Baptist. You know. All you repent. Isaiah 58 says, Cry out, spare not, shall my people their sin. Why does God want to do that? He loves us. He wants us to be with them. He wants us to turn from the sin and follow him. He warns of coming judgment. Edifies, exhorts, comforts in religious matters. These are all things that the prophets do. Recognizes the incarnation and the deity of Jesus. If anybody claims to be a prophet of God, but they do not teach that, that Jesus is divine, they're not of God. Works and lives in harmony with the Bible. Someone may say they're a prophet, they're teaching great things, they're even doing miracles, but they may be living a life that is not in harmony with God's word. Well, you know they're not of God. It's a contradiction there. Will not be an astrologer Magician, witch, medium, clairvoyant. These things are popular today, by the way. You see, someone that doesn't know their Bible, 
They may think, well, what's wrong with these things? Nothing wrong with checking out the astrologer. Don't go into that stuff. <laughs> Mediums, clairvoyants, new age stuff is all like that. In 1 Corinthians 12, we read here that Paul likes the gifts of the church to parts of the body. What part of the body would best represent the, the prophet? So, when you read in 1 Corinthians 12, let's go there for a minute. It gives you the idea of spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 12. Verse 1 says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have your ignorance. So God wants us to understand the spiritual gifts. And then we notice verse 11. But all these work, that one, the self-same spirit, dividing to every man separately as he will. God decides who gets what gift of the Spirit. There are fruit of the Spirit as well. Now, the fruit of the Spirit is the character, love, joy, peace, faith. We all get those. But the gifts of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit decides. I don't tell the Holy Spirit, well, let's say the Holy Spirit, I don't want to be an apostle. <laughs> no. The Holy Spirit decides what gift he will give to who. That's what it tells us here. Then notice. In, in verse 12, for as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. So now he's comparing the church to the to the human body. And, and then he starts talking about different parts of the body. Uh, like he says, verse 14, for the body is not one member but many. You got a head. You got eyes, you got hands, you got feet. It's all part of your body. And he says in verse 15, For if the foot shall say, Because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, <laughs> is it therefore not of the body? No. Every part of our body is a part of this body. And this is why it's so important to be a part of a visible body of Christ, the church. God did not create us to stand alone. It is very hard to be a Christian separated from the body of Christ. We need one another. We need one another's prayers. We need one another's encouragement. And we receive strength from one another. And that's what he's saying here. He says, we're all needed. We all have different gifts. I need your gifts to minister to me. You need my gifts to minister to you. That's like, this body likes this right hand. <laughs> This hand serves this body. And so this body serves this hand. Because if this hand were severed, it wouldn't last very long. So both are needed. So the church needs you. You need the church. It's a two-way street. And of course, when you read on the scriptures, who's the head of the body? Jesus. And as the head directs the body, that's how it's to be in the church. As Christ the head will give direction to the parts of the body. Now the question asks you, what part of the body would best represent the prophet. Well, let's go over here to 1 Samuel 9.9. 9. 1 Samuel 9.9. 9. Before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he spake, Come, and let us go to the seer. For he that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer. So originally, in the Old Testament, prophets were called seers. And so if you talk about the body, the prophet would be compared to the eye. The eye sees things. If you're, uh, how many times have you saved your body from getting hurt because your eye saw something, right? That's how it works in the spiritual realm. A prophet sees things from God. And that prophet will warn the body of what he sees. Now, let's take the prophet John, and we're going to study, for instance, the mark of the beast. God revealed to the prophet so he could see what would come upon the world at the end time. Now, that prophet John saw that, and he is warn the church what's coming. Now we need to understand what he saw. 
so that as a body, <laughs> we can avoid getting hurt and avoid being on the wrong side and, and being deceived by Satan. So it's a very uh, interesting analogy, and it's, it really ties in with the physical and the spiritual here. In what condition, then, would a church be which did not have the gift of prophecy? Well, I think it's pretty clear they would be blind. They, they would not be able to, to see, of course. And that's not too good. Now, that's why I said, but I don't despise prophesying. We need it. Okay, our miracle is a text. Well, there's a text. Let's go to the one in Matthew. It's pretty clear there. Matthew 24, 24, we've read that before, but Jesus is so clear here. Matthew 24, 24. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they should deceive the very elect. So, do, do miracles prove that a prophet is true? No. Does the devil can work miracles. However, don't throw out miracles. As I say, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Um, keep the good. <laughs> there are true miracles. And don't be afraid of true miracles from God. But don't be deceived. Don't look at miracles because miracles are going on over here. Oh, that's evidence God must be there. No. Here's the evidence that God is there. <coughs> what the Word of God is teaching. That's the evidence. Not miracles. Number 19. God promises to speak to a prophet in one of three ways. What are these three ways? Go to Numbers 12. Numbers 12. Fourth book of the Old Testament. Moses wrote this. He wrote the first five books. And took Numbers chapter 12. Notice verse 6, 7, and 8. And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known to him in a vision and will speak to him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all my house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth. So notice the three ways that God can communicate with the prophet. Vision, dream, or mouth to mouth. Those are the, are the three. Now, we're going to see here a list. God sometimes spoke the prophets through visions. Uh, notice how the Bible describes a prophet in vision. We won't look up all these verses, but we'll just review them here. Um, oftentimes when a prophet has a vision, they'll lose physical strength. You read about this with Daniel when he had a vision. But he received supernatural strength. There's no breath in him. But he'll be able to speak. Many times speak when they're in vision. But will not be conscious of his surroundings. Uh, totally caught up with God. His eyes will be open. But again, they're open, but he's not seeing the surroundings. He's, they're open and he's caught up with what God is showing. So there's a few of the physical manifestations that can take place prophet has a, a vision. Now as we go to number 20, what happens to a person who believes and obeys the true prophets? 2 Chronicles 20.20. 20. Today when I was looking this up, and it dawned on me, it's 2020. You think about that 2020 vision, right? I hope you remember this one. 2 Chronicles 20.20. 20. And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe his prophets, so shall you prosper. So, believe his prophets, so shall you prosper. God has given us counsel, warnings, prophecies through prophets, for us to heed what they say. And if we heed what they say, we'll prosper. We'll prosper spiritually, 
physically. I mean, God gives counsels in His Word about health. <laughs> we'll prosper physically. Um, uh, sometimes materially. Um, God can warn you of things, you know. I, I, I won't say this was a prophet like, but, and we've all had these experiences. When we were living in California, my wife and I, uh, we were going to buy a, um, a condo. Uh, it was near Los Angeles, up in Valencia area, uh, along Interstate 5. And um, we had put money down, and, you know, we're waiting for things to come through. And this was in December of 93. I was, I was in the office, and all of a sudden I started feeling sick. Uh, what's going on here? And God brought to my mind, you've got to get out of that deal with the con. Didn't know why, but he started communicating. You got to get out of that. Okay, <laughs> I called up Patty. She had her heart kind of set on it, <laughs> but Patty, she's a wonderful wife. She, you know, we talked about it. She says, "Whatever you think, yes. we were able to get out of that." And on January 15, the earthquake hit. That that one over in uh, 1994. And that area got hit hard. And that's when we decided to move to Arizona. <laughs> we don't want any more shaking of the pits. So, um, you know, God can speak to us, and we, we need to learn to hear his voice. And we will prosper as we, whether it's a prophet speaking to us through his word, whether we learn to hear him speak to us otherwise, learn the voice of God, and he will protect you. It's a wonderful thing. Prophet's ministry. Let's, let's move and see what that is as we go to question 21. He says, are prophets called prayer men to serve the church or unbelievers? Well, 1 Corinthians 14, 22. 1 Corinthians 14, 22. Once you understand the prophets, you will see why this applies. Wherefore, tongues are for the sign not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophecy, prophesying, serves not to them that believe not, but for them that believe. So prophets serve those who believe. Now, why is that true? Because the believers have confidence in God's word. The believer believes in prophets. And the believer then will be receptive to what a prophet has to say. They'll, of course, compare it to the word but it's for the believer. And then we go to 22. Whom did Jesus say would have very great influence in the last days? And we just read that in Matthew 20, 24. Nope, sorry about that. Uh, go back here, I jumped on. Uh, what is prophecy called in Revelation 12, 17? We did see that. It's called the testimony of Jesus. Remember 12, the remnant, keep the commandments of God have the testimony of Jesus. We had that earlier in this lesson. And the testimony of Jesus is a gift of prophecy. So there would be the gift of prophet at the end of time in God's church. And 23, when did Jesus say, I'm sorry, whom did Jesus say would have very, great influence in the last days? And that we read, there would be false Christ and false prophets. Now as we look at some of these, we'll see what some of these are. Um, several verses here. Deuteronomy 18. Let's go over there. God warns us about these in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Satan has always been trying to use these things to lead people astray. Deuteronomy 18, starting with verse 9. When thou come into the land the Lord thy God gives you, you shall not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone that makes his son or his daughters to pass through the fire. That was one of the pagan rituals they had to the false gods. Or that uses divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, a witch, a charmer, Psalter of familiar spirits, a wizard, or no commander, 
For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God has driven them out from before you. Now let's go on to Revelation 22, 15. We see the same warnings in the book of Revelation. 22.15 For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whoever loveless and makes a lie. And then 21.8 Just jump back one. But the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, liars, shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So we've got a whole list of things. Diviners, fortune tellers. You'd be amazed how many Christians think it may be okay to go to a fortune teller. God's word is so clear. Keep away from these. Keep putting yourself on the devil's ground. Observer of times, astrologers. I don't know how many there are, but there are many people that look up their astrology, what do they call it, for the day. That's not a battle. Enchanter. Doing enchanting stuff. Witch, wizard, male or female. Psychic. People go for psychic readings. Consult her with familiar spirits, a spirit medium. That really became popular with New Age and channeling and all that stuff. Necromancer, that's one who supposedly, supposedly consults with the dead. Seances? Heard of those? It's all satanic. Sorcerer? Modern, modern counterpart of sorcery is spiritism. Charmer, one who casts spells or uses charms. Some I know when I was in Indonesia, there's, um, and this is not just in Indonesia, it's in other places, there's black magic and there's white magic. And some will say, well, if someone's attacking you with black magic, then come over to this person and use white magic to counter. It's all the devil, or the Lord to counter. He's the one that can free you from this stuff. So a lot of people, you know, going that, you know, we all remember individuals like Gene Dixon, even presidents, times have gone to these people. Edgar Casey, I heard of him. I remember watching something on the history of him. When he was a little boy, he saw his dead grandfather come back and walk in the, in the, around the farm. Now we studied the dead, right? And when people die, what? They go to sleep. And they don't get resurrected till Jesus comes. So if we see someone dead walking around that we know died, is that is that them? No. Who is it? It's Satan. So we, if you had a chance to look in the life of some of these people, you'd see some spiritualistic stuff. And there's a lot of that stuff around today. John the Baptist did not write a book of the Bible, but he was a true prophet. Whose counsel does the Bible say? People reject and they reject John's counsel. Well. It's pretty clear there. He says they uh, reject the counsel of, of God. Now, as you go to the next slides here, notice some of the titles given to the prophets in Scripture. There's various titles here. Uh, you've got prophet, son of man, uh, seer, we talked about that, messenger, fellow servant, servant of God, man of God, Watchman, voice of one crying in the wilderness, that of course was John the Baptist. When you look at prophets in the Bible, the ministry of prophets vary as far as the extent. There are prophets who God used to minister to his people of all ages. Like, for instance, Moses, you have the writings of Moses, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Paul, Luke. These were prophets that wrote, and their word is here, and this is good for all ages. They had a very expanded ministry as a prophet. Then there's those that's for their generation, like Deborah and Samson. 
we've got different ones. Um, John the Baptist, he was for his generation, uh, praying, praying the way for Christ. Then you've got prophets which have a specific assignment. Uh, Jonah, he, had the, he didn't like the assignment, <laughs> but God finally got him there. He was to go to Nineveh and warn the Jesuits. And then John the Baptist, he certainly had a very specific assignment to prepare the way. <coughs> and then there's prophets for a local church, uh, a local area. If you if we were to read Acts 31, 15, 32, it talks about prophets in Antioch for that church. And it says Judas and Silas gave encouragement, instruction to the church. So there could be the gift of prophecy manifest in the local church for a need. Or it can, again, expand out. Uh, it can be for not just a local church, but for a denomination, for Christianity in general. So there can be variants. And, and the prophet's ministry is to speak authoritatively for God through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. No matter what breadth or depth of their ministry, this is what they're doing. And it's important to, uh, to heed. Now, um, one individual, you might have heard the name uh, Alan White. She died in 1915. Um, but it seems that, that God manifested this gift through her. Um, there's some, some books she's written. Um, one of the well-known books, The Desire of Ages, of the Life of Christ. Um, many different spiritual books that were written. Uh, plus, God gave counsels on health uh, through her. Now, you know, in the 1800s, medical science wasn't too well advanced. Uh, if you, when you had surgery, if you didn't get an infection, you weren't healing them. <laughs> and when they did a surgery, I don't know if the barbers still do it, uh, but you know, they, they, you got a razor, they have the razor strap. The surgeons actually would take their boot, get a sharp, touch it. They had no idea of bacteria and stuff like that. That's where medical science was back then. Well, God wanted to get information to his people, so they could avoid some of that stuff. And I find it very fascinating. Here, I'm just going to share with you a couple of things here that, that God brought uh, through this lady. In um, a professor, Clyde McKay, um, professor of nutrition at Cornell in New York, he wrote this book. The writings of Ellen White provide a guide to nutrition that comprehends the whole body. Ellen White died before modern biochemistry. She died in 1950. And the composition of foods became generally known. But if people followed her plan, even today, they would be far better fed than they are in their attempts to eat bad diets and then compensate by miracle foods. I'll show you a couple other things she wrote, which I found fascinating. Sunlight. There used to be a time that if someone's sick, you know, close the shades, keep the room dark, quiet. 1865, she said that Sunlight purifies the air. We know sunlight destroys bacteria. She's talking about that back in 1865. She says death producing germs abound in dark, neglected corners, in decaying refuse and dampness, mold and must. She's talking about that again back in the 1860s. <laughs> I'll give you a couple of here. Fascinating to see. Oh, yeah. You know, I was born in the 40s, and, and my parents had the idea, especially my mother, if you have a plump baby, healthy. I've always had a bit of a challenge. And uh, they had what they called husky G. You know, if you buy pants for boys, huskies, all oh, my mom was proud of them. I wore huskies. <laughs> well, <laughs> Ellen White wrote in 1868, she warned certain overweight individuals of their being liable to acute attacks of disease and sudden death. Now, that's nothing new today, <laughs> but back in the 1860s, that was rather radical advice. Sugar, 1890, the free use of sugar in any form tends to clog the system and not infrequently a cause of disease. She didn't say don't eat any, but 
We know now, you know, it lowers the immune system with white blood cells and all that. We know that today. You see, God loves his people. And he will give counsels to us, spiritual counsels to us for our spiritual well-being and for our physical well-being. Exercise. 1870. The muscles and veins are enabled better to perform their work. There will be increased vitality, which is um, so necessary to health when we exercise. And that exercise has just really come on in the last generation or so. Oh, let's see here. A lot of other things you wrote. Oh, oh tobacco. <laughs> you know, there was a time doctors used to prescribe tobacco. They don't do it anymore, right? <laughs> if they do, they're quiet. Okay, notice what she said about tobacco. 1864. She called it a slow, insidious, but most malignant poison. 1860s. So, you know, as, as I read through over and over again, you come through after come through. Um, Paul Harvey, you remember him, he passed away two years ago. He wrote this. They did a study of Adventists in California, and they, they analyzed the birth certificates and um, who had died over the past five years. They found this. Adventists, Seventh day Adventists, live a life expectancy five to six years greater than other Californians. They have 70% fewer Adventists die from all types of cancer, 68% fewer from respiratory disease, 88% fewer from TB, 85% fewer from pulmonary emphysema. Adventists have 40% less strokes, 60% less heart disease. So um, what's the proof? Well, it looks pretty good <laughs> that uh, the counsel that God gave to her was good. Um, we're going to have, I don't have enough of these tonight. There's one of the books she wrote called Step to Christ tomorrow, not tomorrow, Wednesday. Um, we're going to be getting some of these and we'll give these out to everybody. So you have one good little book on um, on basic Christian living, God's love for man, um, the sinner's need of Christ. A little book I've read numerous times. Many Christians of many denominations have read this book and found it a great blessing. I think you'll enjoy it. We'll have that for you. Okay, well, and the last question is for your own response. I'm not going to forget the quiz tonight. I did this morning, so here we go. Let's see what we get. I did do the quiz after I was going to Okay, let's go to the quiz. It's fill in the blanks. Take out your envelope. Make sure your name's on it. Number one, to whom does God re reveal his plans for the future? Two words. I'll give you the first word, the. Second word starts with a P. God promises to speak through, starts with a P in these last days. J was the prophet who received the revelation of Jesus Christ. Four, prophets are one of the, starts with a G, given to the church. Number five, revelation teaches that God's true church for the last the D will have the gift of prophecy. Let's see what you got. God reveals his plans through the prophets. God's promise to speak through prophets in these last days. John, did you get that? John was the prophet of the religion. Prophets are one of the gifts. Did you remember that? Gifts of the Spirit. Gifts to the church. And Revelation teaches that God's true church and for the last days, last days, the remnant of the gift of Christ. We're going to study the church next time, by the way. Um, you get that lesson as you need. Okay, your response questions. Number one, put an X in box one. If you believe that the Bible teaches that God will use prophets to help the church in the last days, put an X in box one. Number two, if you agree that God's true church has the gift of prophecy in these last days, put an X in box two. And that's it. So next time, we're going to study the Revelation description of God's church. You can see this as you leave.
Please remember to give the envelopes to uh, the ladies as you leave and let everything spill out. Um, again, we're having a drawing for the Bible again and uh, your graduation too. Next meeting, today is Monday, right? Did any of you lose track of what day it is? <laughs> I do. Today is Monday. Our next meeting is Wednesday. Wednesday night. If you want to come Wednesday morning, I encourage you to so drop by and see it more. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the time you've had to study your word. We thank you for the gift of prophet. And that through that gift, Lord, you have blessed your church through the ages. And we thank you that you promised to continue that gift right up to the end of time for your remnant people. And I pray, Lord, that you will continue to guide each of us as we study your word, as we seek to be faithful to you, putting in our heart to obey you in all things, that when Jesus comes, we'll be ready to meet him. In his name we pray. Amen. Good night and enjoy your refreshments as you leave.